So hopefully you'll all hear a message. So we are recording this session uh, to make it available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so please feel free to turn your cameras off during the presentation. Um, and there'll be a chance at the end to ask any questions that you might have. If you can't stay for the whole session and you have a burning question, put it in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, and we can ask it at the end and then you can watch the recording back. So hello everyone, you're all very welcome to our third in 20 webinar. My name is Claire Smith. I'm your host for the session today. I'm the marketing lead for Ergo Health and I'm also the parent of a 13 year old boy who is a full time wheelchair user. The purpose of these sessions is really to cover topics of interest uh, to the assistive tech, the seated mobility and the wider occupational therapy community. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Dr. Baron Tahar from BES Healthcare with us for today's session covering managing progressive disorders. Barand has achieved global recognition as a result of his work, his training and his knowledge within the assistive technology and healthcare markets. And he has been a huge supporter of our work here at Ergo Health and we're very uh, thankful for his support. So Barand, I'm going to hand over to you now and I will keep an eye on the chat and the waiting room. Okay. Well. Good afternoon. Thanks for turning up. And I hope you've had your lunch or can eat it quietly in the background. I was asked by Sheena to talk about managing progressive disorders. And that's what I'm uh, going to try and do over the next 20 minutes. So what I hope to cover is a quick introduction to what kind of progressive disorders in children we're talking about, which ones we're talking about in adults, look at some of the clinical implications, partly macro and partly the micro picture, look at some seating principles, some basic ones that really are relevant to all seating uh, challenges, and talk about dynamic seating and how important that is and what we can do towards uh, helping out people who have to be seated for quite a long time. And that will finish off with dynamic postural management. So starting with the progressive disorders in children, and one of the most common progressive disorders is muscular dystrophy. I say one of the most common, there are over 30 different muscular dystrophies, some of which are apparent in children and some in adult and some linking between the two. Some of these are called myopathies, got the metabolic myopathies and the congenital myopathies. And myopathies are basically problems that arise due to dysfunctions of the muscle fibers themselves. And then we have the muscular dystrophies. Some are described as limb girdle ones, and we'll see a little bit more about those in a moment. Some are called myotonic dystrophies, and some are congenital muscular dystrophies. And a muscular dystrophy really most often is a result of problems in producing the muscle membrane proteins um, that are around the muscle proteins that make the muscle muscles work. And uh, these, these appear in different formats and a lot of their formats have been named after individuals who have described them in the first place. So we have First on the list is Duchenne and Mus Becker muscular dystrophies. These are both inherited and appear in boys rather than in girls and tend to appear from quite a young age. Then there's a different version called Emery Dreyfus. And you can see in these pictures, the darkened part of the body is, indicates the different bits of the body that are affected by these different varieties of muscular dystrophies. So we have limb girdle, which was mentioned earlier, and you can see those darkened bits are very much around controlling the uh, upper part of the legs and the upper part of the shoulders. We have the fascio scapulo humeral, and you can see in the picture there, we've got the facial bits, and we've got the scapular bit around the shoulders and the humeral around the lower part of the legs. And then there's oculofangeal, which 
We've got the eyes and the pharyngeal bit is, is it affects the muscles around the neck as well. And then there's quite a large group which is brought under the spinal muscular atrophy. And there's more than one category of SMA. And this again affects slightly different parts of the muscle system. But the outcome of all of these is that over time, the youngsters who have these are usually suffering from a progressive disorder. Some have a very short life expectancy, maybe not much beyond puberty, and others carry on into adulthood. When we look at the adult range, we have most common is the myotonic muscular dystrophies. We have motor neuron disease, which can come on very quickly and lead very quickly to complete incapacitation for the client who's got it. Multiple sclerosis is pretty common, Parkinson's disease, and old age, something that now I'm on my 70s, I'm more appreciative of. And as a progressive disorder, this is something all of us are probably going to meet in time. And the progression is that things we can do today, next year we might not be able to do so well, and so on. So will all of us face one way or another progressive disorders? So what are the implications of that? Well, the clinical implications, the big picture is that a progressive order does need regular review. And that regular review is not just look at the individual and their needs, but what equipment they can have to help them facilitate everyday life as much as possible. And what changes to the equipment do we need to be offering? And a lot of the disorders we've been discussing have stable periods and then periods of fast change. So it's not very easy for a service clinician to say, right, we'll bring you in every six months to check you out, because sometimes six months not might, much might have happened, whereas in other cases, six weeks might have happened. So it does need a lot of flexibility in maintaining that person's requirements. And for the individuals, some days are better than others. Uh, if you've got Parkinson's, for example, in the early days, you may find some days doesn't affect you very much, and other days you really are in a bad way. So look, let's look very quickly at some of the seating principles that we should be addressing. And seating really is there to facilitate function. And we really should be considering sitting as an activity. And unfortunately, textbooks tend to show pictures of people sitting in 90, 90, 90 positions. I know I'm not sitting in one at the moment. I'm not sure how many people on this webinar are sitting in 90, 90, but that's not a normal position. So we really need to think about what is the activity that the person is needing to, is trying to achieve and make sure that the person can move into that position to achieve that activity. So I'm going to cover a couple of small topics on this. First one is considering the zone of control. So what is the zone of control? Well, that is really looking at what you can do from a joint and how far you can reach with that joint to control something. So finer control might be needed for operating a keyboard or a joystick on a power wheelchair, whatever. And we can look at each joint. We can see there's a range of motion, uh, a range of movement that gives you a restriction overall and it really depends on how much you control yourself around that joint, what your total zone of control will be, what's the biggest area or smallest area you can reach. And when we're prescribing equipment, we really need to be looking at the person's range of movement to be able to ascertain where to put things and what they're most likely to be able to do. So if you're placing a, uh, a joystick on a powered wheelchair, can the person reach it? Can they operate it? If you are placing things on a table, will they be able to move the uh, elbow joint, their shoulder joint? And has the progressive disorder started limiting how much their zone of control is being limited? And just an example of a range of uh, disorders, if you are a quadriplegic as a result of a, um, a neck injury, C4 level, then you've got very limited movement and zone of control you can actually reach. So it's probably just a bit of movement around the neck. C5, C6, a little bit further down the neck, you may be able to get a little bit further. 
The green area is where somebody with multiple sclerosis might be able to reach, it's limited. Whereas a paraplegic, who's really only got the lower body affected, with good support, he can often reach a long way. So we really need to look at each individual and see what they're capable of doing at that time. And with the progressive disorders, their zone of control is going to go down and get reduced. So uh, the aids they need on their equipment may vary to help them ma maximize what they can do. Another thing I'd like to bring up here is that not everybody's been aware, but uh, there was a new standard a couple of years ago, a British standard, 8625, and that's now coming out as an ISO standard for selection, placement, and fixation of postural support devices in seating. And one of the bits of advice it does give is managing posterior pelvic tilt and where you should position a positioning belt. If, and that should really be ideally in front of the greater trochanters. As we can see in this picture, why? The red circle is the greater trochanter, and the belt is well in front of that. The point about that is that the belt length is a lot shorter in that position than if you had it going to the corner of the back support in the seat, because that, if you consider the pelvis as a big ball, the longest distance across a ball, its diameter, and there have been cases of people who have been submarining underneath a belt when it's been at 45 degrees uh, because the belt is so big they can submarine underneath it. Whereas at shorter distance we have for the belt in this picture, they can't submarine underneath it. But the other benefit is that it means that you can still rotate around the pelvis to reach further forward. And in the uh, ISO 16840 uh, part 15, they recommend that's the furthest back position you put a belt, but they also say it is just as effective having it across your thigh further, further forward. And sometimes it's easier to do up when it's further forward than if it's around some of the tummy flesh and the clothing uh, at the waist. However, uh, a lot of uh, people with the muscular dystrophies, Duchenne is very common, actually develop an anterior pelvic tilt because of trying to get into a central position to balance without having to use many core muscles because the core muscles are weak. And the best way of using a belt and on a, uh, to manage an anterior pelvic tilt is to use a four-point belt. And uh, one uses the broader bit of the belt to pull across the front of the, pel of the pelvis, the AISS, and then use the finer bit of the belt coming down at 90 degrees to make sure that the belt doesn't rise up into the soft tissues of the belly. So those are some of the, we started to talk about some of the clinical implications, the macro one, how do you set up a chair in the first place on the day that somebody's in the clinic? But we do need to be aware of what does that person want to do during the day? So all of us do different things from our seats during the day. Sometimes we're eating a meal, sometimes we are working at a laptop or computer. Sometimes we're sitting on a toilet. We've got different tasks that need different positioning to facilitate what we're trying to do from that seated position. So a good seating setup, equipment setup, should allow for what that person wants to do during the day. If they're never going to use a computer or a laptop, there's no point in setting up the chair for that function. But if they are going to eat, which most people do, then that is in consideration. If most of the day they're front, in front of the television or doing leisure, then that's a very different position uh, that people have to be provided for. But what can we do with the equipment to help them to get from one position or one task to another if they've got trouble with their muscle strength? The other thing, remembering that sitting is an activity, so we want to have the seating set up as much as possible so that people can change their position from one activity to another. And another important thing is that fatigue builds up over time. During the day, uh, people will get more tired doing the same thing. And as the day progresses, they will need more help from their equipment to carry on doing the tasks. So let's look at dynamic support. A lot of dynamic support we see in wheelchairs and so forth is being put in for energy absorption. And do we do that to protect the equipment or do we do it to protect the client? 
we know that people who've got a lot of extensor spasms and so forth have got a lot of forces on the wheelchair. And sometimes we put things on the wheelchair to help absorb those forces. And sometimes we are trying to protect the client from the forces they put on themselves so they don't damage themselves. So some of the equipment we can put on a wheelchair can absorb outside forces. An example of that are the frog leg casters, which look like these. And they've got in the middle there a little shock absorber so that as the wheels casters go over rough ground, the vibrations absorbed before they go into the body and into the chair. Another thing that uh, we'd recommend are air foam cushions. And a study in Pittsburgh was looking at the amount of vibration absorption of different cushions. They looked at pure air filled cushions, they looked at gel filled cushions, they looked at air foam cushions. And air foam cushions were the best um, materials to absorb vibrations for wheelchair users, and it is the vibrations going through the wheelchair that can be very tiring for the individual. We also can look at equipment that absorbs the client forces. So as people extend and so forth, how can we take some of that force away so it doesn't start damaging parts of the wheelchair? And in some cases, people put spring-loaded um, elements into the seat back support. And another example, if I can show up here, this is a headrest a tone deflector, which is made by Stealth. And in this, you can see that there is a circle that attaches the back, so that attaches to the back and one end on the left side and to the head support on the right. And in the middle, there are some rubber shock absorbers, a bit like you have, might have in a car. And those are set up in different points around this so that whichever direction your head is pushing in, it allows a few degrees of movement and absorbs the energy before it starts damaging the mounting system for the head support. But some of the dynamic sports can actually enable the client. So we've looked at things that protect the client uh, and the chair, but what can we do to help the client? And some of these can be passive dynamic assistance. And an example here is shoulder harnesses or chest harnesses with, chest, with stretch stretch straps attached to them such as the stay flex and the picture here on the right the bits that go up over the shoulder and the bits get that gets attached to the lower side those can stretch but the middle bit doesn't because uh, research has shown that if the whole thing stretches it tends to ride up and there have been cases of people with stretching all stretch lycra type shoulder harnesses butterfly harnesses have been strangled as a result. So again, the standard I mentioned earlier does reflect on what is safe and what isn't. And that's kind of passive assistance we're talking about with that harness. If a person uh, comes forward to reach for things, the elasticity helps to bring them back. But what I'd like to finish off with is just looking at active dynamic assistance. So this is what we call under the heading of dynamic postural management. And this is where we bring in the Ergo system. There are one or two systems around the marketplace, but the Ergo one has got the most to offer. And here's a picture of an Ergo seat with a youngster in it. And what he's got underneath him there, he's got a one picture shows two, but it's one pad under the thighs, two pads underneath the pelvis of the back, a lumbar pad, and two lateral pads. And each of those are air-filled pads. So the amount of support that they can give is varied by the amount of air that's in each of those pads. And the beauty of these is that it is a smart system. So on the left-hand side of this picture, the clinician can set up the posture of the individual as the clinician would like that to be, and in working obviously with the client as to what works for them to be functional. And as the person gets weak and tired of fatigue, posture changes. The system adjusts the inflation to correct for the deviation and brings the person back into a posture that is more functional for them. So this is something go on behind the scenes to help overcome the tiredness. But the other thing about the Ergo system is that it's got the means that the clinician doesn't have to go and keep on meeting up with the clients. They can do this very quickly on a telehealth session. 
So on this picture, we've got the client sitting in the chair, the clinician in the top left there, and the clinician can make adjustments to the settings within the whole seating system at each of the pads so that they can accommodate the progression of a progressive disorder or the different needs for the client. Maybe they're getting a bit bigger and their, trying, their weight distribution is changing. So the clinician has the benefit, but the other thing is that the individual here can also have a handheld app on his phone where rather than relying on the system responding, they can tune up the different pads to help them into the individual positions they require. So we've moved from static seating all the way through dynamic aspects of seating to active dynamic aspects of seating, all of which work particularly well with people with progressive disorders because this system that we have in front of us now can change during the day, can be changed by the individual during the day as their needs change and their tasks change. So in summary of what I've covered in the last 20 minutes is, first of all, seating should not be seen as static, sitting is activity, and the equipment should facilitate this. The prescribed equipment needs to be adjustable and or replaced in a timely manner to meet the changing needs over time. The equipment should meet the dynamic needs of the user as the needs change task by task and hour by hour. And the important thing is the devil is in the detail and it's the smaller parts of the seating system and the finer adjustability that will make the most difference to the user. So thank you for joining us. The next, my contact details, if you've got any queries on the bottom left of the screen and the next in 20 session is due on the 1st of November at 1.30, a little later starting time I see. So back to you, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, that was excellent. I will open it up now for any questions. If anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. If not, I have a few. <laughs> but uh, I just feel free to put your camera back on and ask away. Or if you're shy, drop it into the chat box and I can ask for you. Claire, you no. launch first then. So uh, this is everybody else will know this, but I don't. What what would you mean submarine and under a belt? Is that shifting underneath? Is that uh, good question? Um, we get used to using the term submarining. The uh, the problem has been that people have been able to get slide underneath it, um, particularly if there's an appreciable ridge in their cushion, so there's nothing to stop them sliding forwards. And there have been cases reported in the States and in the UK of people who have died as a result of strangulation okay. having slipped all the way through and not having the strength to be able to get themselves out of that. Um, it's really interesting that you describe sitting as an activity. Um, I don't think I've actually heard that term before, you know, or, or that it's said in that way. But it's it's so interesting because my own son is is never sitting still. He is always in constant movement. And, you know, it's, it kind of explains why he is so tired at the end of the day for a, you know, a non-mobile person. But, yeah, for him, sitting is, is definitely like a, a full-time activity. Well, the interesting thing to me, discussing the other day with a colleague is that um, some years ago somebody pointed out that wheelchair should actually be considered to be an orthosis or orthotic. It's not just a, a piece of metal with wheels on it, it is actually something that should be designed for the individual to fit the individual to allow them to be more functional. Mm. It kind of leads me on to my, my next question. Where, like, where do you see this is maybe too big a question to ask. Where do you see assistive tech, you know, in like the next 20 years? What do you think is going to be the big change or, you know, something that we just can't really comprehend at the moment? Uh, I think a lot, a lot of it is people's knowledge of where they can get equipment. And I've been talking to one or two people recently who have suddenly found that they've got a close relative who needs some equipment. And because they know I've been working with this system, they come to me for advice, but people don't even know where to start looking. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge too, is that a lot of people don't realize that 
they can get the basics from the NHS or the social services, but they are allowed to top up. Mm-hmm. And there's a heck of a lot of solu- good solutions around the place that cost a bit more money than is currently available normally through the NHS or social services. But a little bit of top up money in there can give them a lot more functionality, a lot more comfort, a lot more safety. And I think that's part of uh, where things are going is people, as we've got an aging population, there's going to be a slightly better knowledge base of what people can uh, uh, get and uh, we'll get a little bit wiser and people will get smarter on their Google searches Mm -hmm. and maybe it's up to people in the industry to make sure that the correct kind of answers are there so we can anticipate what somebody who's coming across these things the first time might want to ask. Mm, it's really interesting point. Diane, you've got your hand raised there. Yeah, it's kind of a comment as well as a, I suppose, rather than a question. And it also leads to the commentary we've just had actually about this sort of wider issue of clients and, and families being more involved in decisions. And I guess it's with progressive conditions, particularly when they are remitting, et cetera, and can be over very different timescales. It's sometimes very disappointing that the provision is often on a tariff that's related to a specific point in time that enables a certain piece of equipment without looking at the future proofing and enabling that could be done with a higher spec that would actually be a lot more cost effective as well as improving outcomes over a course of time and I think particularly given longer lead times now between reassessments you know this whole thing needs to have a very changed perspective I think on on how things are issued assessed and issued. I think also come back to your last question, Claire, is I think the telehealth aspects have got more opportunity because it does take a lot of time, energy and carbon to get people to in front of clients. And sometimes, as I showed in that uh, penultimate slide, you can have good access to individuals, intelligent individuals who are taking ownership of their own treatment and you can work with them with a short session that doesn't involve a lot of clinic time. Mm, yeah. yeah, I've had a few um, you know, video consultations and, and, you know, obviously prompted by, by the pandemic, but it's been really, you know, revolutionary in terms of not having to try and get parked and the travel involved and all that. So on both sides, you know, patient, patient and clinician. Um, is there any, you know, I know obviously we're very fortunate to have the NHS here, but it's across the rest of the world, is there any countries that you would look to for best practice in managing progressive disorders that you think to yourself, God, they've, they've really got it right there. You know, that's that's a model that, that we should aim for. I think probably country by country is probably not the best way to look at it because it's going to be a postcode lottery. Mm-hmm. In this country, you'll get better wheelchair services than others. You'll be closer to better hospitals than others. Uh, the Scandinavians do quite well because there's more money per head okay. to equipment. And um, just at uh, Rare Care a couple of weeks ago, we're looking at a nice piece of equipment that's coming out of body points that is there to support individual arms for somebody who's had a stroke or whatever in a very positive ergonomic way. And that's being launched into Scandinavia, first of all, because they have got the funds available for people to have the right equipment on day one. Whereas in this country, people, we also, we all say that health is free or healthcare is free. We're actually paying for it, but we believe that everything is free at the point of delivery. And therefore it's not a common idea for people. Actually, you can spend a bit of more money than you already paid in your taxes to get a better piece of equipment. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, we just had a comment there to say that somebody had to leave, but thank you very much. It was an interesting session. Um, I just have a look down if anybody has any other questions. Now is the time. If not, we will draw the session to a close. And uh, thank you very much, Baron. That was excellent. As I said, we will make the recording available uh, in the next day or so. I'll get it uploaded and we can share the links with you. And as you mentioned, um, our next session is the 1st of November at half one. Um, and we are covering managing the CD needs of children with hip dysplasia in that one. So quite a specific one, but that was a request that came through from a previous attendee. So we're going to cover that topic in the next one. But thank you all very much. And I will end the session. So feel free to disconnect. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.